Chapter 5 is one of those chapters that I think the uncharitable reader of Moby Dick would be willing to throw away, or at least offer up as an example of, oh man, I, you know, Moby Dick's got some good parts, but why does it have to be so long? There's so many chapters you can just get rid of. And, and it's a classic example where I just strongly disagree. This chapter has very little to say that is truly figurative. It's not making big claims about abstract ideas. And I'm totally okay with that because it is funny and it has some interesting things going on. So we start the chapter after Ishmael goes into the main room of the Spouter Inn to have breakfast with a nice orange passage. And I like the orange passages because they're just kind of fun things to think about. You don't need to fit it into this big pattern of knowledge and truth and meaning and understanding and epistemic access and blah, 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 blah. Just think about it because I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, he kind of expostulates on laughing. However, a good laugh is a mighty good thing and rather too scarce a good thing. The more's the pity. So if any one man in his own proper person affords stuff for a good joke to anybody, let him not be backward, but let him cheerfully allow himself to spend and to be spent in that way. And the man that has anything bountifully laughable about him, be sure there is more in that man that you perhaps think for. So wow, just what a passage, right? Uh, laughing is good. We should always laugh. Uh, don't be afraid to laugh or be laughed at because it's a fun, good thing. And then finally, he takes it to that serious place at the end that says, and even if you do laugh at someone, remember that that's not their entire being. I mean, yeah, you could throw this chapter away, but you would miss like three of the very best, most pithy most concrete and concise expostulations of the role of humor in life just thrown in here at breakfast. So I, I for one, am going to not throw away these passages, and I want to highlight them in orange to give them their due, because something like that is it's beautiful. All right. It's a short chapter, though. So, oh my god, I went backward. You hate to see it as a sports fan. All right, so we go forward. There's only one passage I marked in yellow here, uh, and that is... Ishmael thinking about Ledyard and Mungo Park. Okay, let's read the passage and we'll we'll see what his point is. Okay. They say that men who have seen the world and thereby become quite at ease in manner, quite self-possessed in company. Not always, though. Ledyard, let's see if see, even Kindle doesn't know who Ledyard was. The great New England traveler and Mungo Park, the Scotch one of all men, they possess the least assurance in the parlor. But perhaps the mere crossing of Siberia in a sledge drawn by dogs as Ledyard did, or the taking of a long solitary walk on an empty stomach in the Negro heart of Africa, which was the sum of poor Mungo's performances, this kind of travel, I say, may not be the very best mode of attaining a high social polish. So I think you'll see where in the mosaic of knowledge and understanding and truth passages this fits it's in the social category and seems to highlight how different forms of experience do not provide knowledge which is necessarily universal so even though there is a great ironic phrase here mere crossing of siberia in a sledge drawn by dog which is anything but mere okay anything but mere that might give you a lot of knowledge and experience but that knowledge and experience isn't necessarily transferable to all uh, moments of life which need interpretation in this case like how to act at a tea party really mungo park and ledyard's uh you know exploratory uh expeditions have nothing to say about how to act correctly at a high class tea party so it talks about here perhaps the limitations of various forms of experience and the narrowness of human knowledge towards particular aims as opposed to universal knowledge which is pretty impossible to acquire and then I find the value of chapter five is left to humor, which I don't want to underrate. Uh, so it seems that the inn is full of these sailors who came in last night. It says, you know, when Ishmael is eating dinner that all these people come in. Yet at this moment in, during breakfast, it says that every man maintained a profound silence. Here were a set of sea dogs, many of whom without the slightest bashfulness had boarded great whales on the high seas, entire strangers to them, and dueled them dead without winking. And yet here as they sat at a social breakfast table, all of the same calling, all of kindred tastes, 
looking round as sheepishly at each other as though they had never been out of sight of some sheepfold among the green mountains. A curious sight, these wonderful alliterative phrase here, bashful bears, these timid warrior whalemen, right? And that, of course, is just a humorous way of saying the exact same thing that's set up here in yellow, that the experience of these whalemen doesn't necessarily prepare them for the world of the breakfast table and the good social graces uh, that are necessary to make small talk. And then, of course, you have Queequeg, who is immune to he is both simultaneously lacking in this knowledge and understanding in reference to a social framework, yet he is totally immune to caring. <laughs> he is the Emersonian self-reliant man, if I've ever seen it. As for Queequeg, why Queequeg sat there among them at the head of the table, too, so it chanced, as cool as an icicle. To be sure, I cannot say much for his breeding. His greatest admirer could not have cordially justified his bringing his harpoon into breakfast with him and using it there without ceremony, reaching over the table with it to the imminent jeopardy of many heads and grappling the beefsteaks toward him. But that was certainly very coolly done by him, and everyone knows that in most people's estimation, to do anything coolly is to do it genteely. Okay, I should have marked that one orange because that's just a little different, but also super cool, right? Like, he's referencing ideas that have been around forever. Why do we think that certain people are cool because they they do it... Uh, if you are cool, it doesn't matter how outside the norm you are, you will make people think that you are genteel, i.e. polite or refined. So just be cool. Keep it cool. We will not speak of all Queequeg's peculiarities here, how he eschewed coffee and hot rolls and applied his undivided attention to beefsteaks done rare. Enough that when breakfast was over, he withdrew like the rest into the public room, lighted his tomahawk pipe, and was sitting there quietly digesting and smoking with his inseparable hat on while I sallied out for a stroll. I just, I just love Queequeg's total independence from caring about what anyone else thinks. It's a beautiful thing and something we should all emulate.